So uh, let's, let's start in prayer. Dear Lord and Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you for the hand that is always upon us. We thank you for our health and strength, Lord, and safety to be here tonight. We pray you'll be with this time, Lord, that you will just speak, that people will learn what you want them to learn, and uh, that you'll protect us, Father, from any other influence that is not of you. Just be with us this night, Lord. Teach us, help us to be your servants, to know you more, to serve you better, uh, because that is our desire. In Jesus' precious name we ask it, amen. So uh, let's recap session two, where we got to. So in session two, we looked at Islam, Islam which had gobbled up about half of the empire in about 30 years. We looked at the east-west divide to 1453 and the fall of Constantinople. We looked at the effect of power and money on the Western Church, which basically resulted in people listening to services they didn't understand, with no access to scripture, which uh, was written in Latin, earning salvation through the sacraments of the church. But we also looked at the hunger for reform of the church, which resulted in Luther's challenge to the sale of indulgences, leading to the break with the church. So we left Luther in Wartburg, uh, he was translating the New Testament, but what was happening in Wittenberg while Luther was in Wartburg Castle? Now Luther had not actually instituted any changes in religious life. He tended to be wary of innovation, but while he was gone, Melanchthon and another colleague, Karlstadt, made concrete changes in line with the new understanding. So monks and nuns left their monastic communities, they got married. Worship was simplified. The services are now in German, not in Latin, so people actually understand what they're hearing. Masses for the dead are abolished, also days of fasting. Now, Melanchthon began to give communion in both kinds, that is, the bread and the wine. Previously, people had not been given wine, they had just been given the bread. So Luther returned to Wittenberg, though, leaving the safety of Wartburg, when some in Wittenberg began to smash images. He felt that they were going too far, and uh, once back, he was involved in helping a whole set of nuns to leave their nunnery, which meant that he had to provide for them by finding husbands for them. And one of them, Katharina von Bora, declared that there were only two men that she could be prevailed upon to marry, and one of them was Luther. And he, expecting probably that at some point he would be burned at the stake, had no intention of marrying. But marry he did. They had six children and were very happy. And Luther's family life is captured in the table talks that his students compiled and published. They also brought in uh, orphans too. So then we have what is happening in uh, Switzerland. Now around about the same time, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich had come to similar beliefs, but from a very different standpoint. Uh, Zwingli was not a tormented monk. He was a priest studying scripture. He was trained in the methods of humanism, which we'll remember at this point means a study of the humanities, not a value system that puts humans at the center of everything. So he went back to the sources. He had been a priest in an abbey popular for pilgrimages, and he preached against gaining merit by pilgrimages, by fasting, by abstinence. He said he didn't see any New Testament support for any of it. He had the support of the civil government in Zurich, so he, over time, made the same sorts of changes in church, communion of both kinds, simple worship, monks and nuns can marry. He provided education for all. And uh, then we come to Calvin. Now, Calvin didn't leave a record about his, his faith journey the way that Luther did, but by 1535, he must have burnt his boats with the Roman Catholic Church because he was in exile in Switzerland. Calvin wanted to be a scholar, not a leader at all, but he ended up leading the church in both Strasbourg and Geneva. Now, he's a systemizer of thought. Luther had been so taken up with his delight in justification by faith that he didn't really address many of the other doctrines were important. Calvin did, and the result is the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which was published successively in five editions between 1536 and then 1559, 1560 is the last one, in both Latin and French. And the final edition consists of four books, Book one deals with God and revelation, creation and human nature. Book two, God as redeemer, how this is made known to us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Book three, through the spirit we share in the grace of Jesus and produce fruit. And book four, the external means of sharing church and the sacraments. 
Now, later Calvinists made the doctrine of predestination a main focus of Calvin's theology, and that is how he's often remembered today. And if you know anything about Calvin, probably the first thing you'll think of is predestination. But that was later on and not really so much Calvin himself. Now, there is an interesting one for us here, a group called the Anabaptists. So Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin all saw church and state as mutual support. So there was a place for the state. But the Anabaptists were a group who saw a contradiction in that. They said that before the conversion of Constantine, the church had stood out from society. And they said that you can't be a member of the church just because you're born into a Christian country or you're the citizen of a Christian city. You need personal faith. So they rejected infant baptism and they began to baptize adult believers upon confession of faith. They were also strictly pacifist and they wouldn't take oaths, which was a problem in normal civil life because taking oaths was a big part of just how you lived at that time. So they were persecuted from all sides. They were considered as heretics and the civil government wasn't keen on them either because they were pacifists. Um, they were mostly in Zurich. Uh, Switzerland is a neutral country, but it has always provided mercenaries for various conflicts around the world. If you've watched movies or whatever, you may have heard about Swiss mercenaries. So, I mean, even back then, Switzerland itself would supply armies. So if you were a person in Switzerland who would not fulfill your military duty, uh, you were not going to be popular. Now, uh, they did get violent. They joined peasant revolts. They took over the city of Münster. This revolt was put down with savagery. And after that, they really returned to the pacifist beliefs, believing that the yeah, excursion into violence had been wrong. So uh, everywhere they went, they, uh, they were persecuted or kicked out because of their refusal to join armies and fight, and that includes in North America in the beginning. Now, uh, interesting Mennonites here today are the descendants of Anabaptists. They have some of the same beliefs. Now, there were shades of difference between various reformers, and the issue where they disagreed was regarding the presence of Christ in communion. They're all reacting to the medieval Roman church belief that the mass is a sacrifice, the theory of transubstantiation, the bread and wine becomes the very body and blood of Jesus every time. It reunites Calvary, and you gain merit by partaking in this sacrament. And all the reformers said no. Jesus died once for all. He and his resurrected body are now in heaven at the right hand of God. But they disagreed exactly over what happens. Luther believed that Jesus' body had the quality of omnipresence, like God does, that he could be everywhere at once, and therefore he could be in heaven and present in many other places at the same time. So it's, there's no physical change. The bread and wine does not turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus. But it's not just a symbol either. Believers are nourished, something is taking place. Now, Swingley, he said, symbolic only, the bread and wine is bread and wine, that's it. It's the faith of the partaker that makes the action important. And Calvin came down kind of in the middle. The presence is real, but it's a spiritual presence. The bread and wine is bread and wine. It doesn't turn into the body and blood of Jesus, but rather than the body of Jesus coming down, like Roman Catholic belief, it's more that believers are taken up and they have a foretaste of heaven in the sacrament of communion. So it was that understanding that uh, ended up dividing the movement into what we would now call Lutheran and Reformed. Uh, Luther wasn't into change for its own sake. So he kept as many traditional practices as weren't specifically condemned by scripture. The Calvinists Reformed, they go the other way. If in doubt, throw it out. Any practice not found in scripture is to be discontinued, which included music, apart from singing the Psalms. Later developments in both were concerned with minute theological detail. Remember last week where we considered the Western tendency to define and define and define in uh, contradistinction to the Eastern church, which is much more prepared to hold a mystery without having to define it? Well, this was certainly true of the followers of the reformers. And so we get creeds, statements of belief. The 39 Articles is the Church of England. The Book of Concord is the Lutheran main statement of belief. Westminster Confession of Faith for Reformed or Presbyterians. Articles of Religion for Methodists. And there are lots of them for Baptists, actually, and I don't actually know which one uh, 
Canadian Baptist, this Baptist sort of would hold to, so maybe one of the pastors can tell us afterwards. So it's worth looking at the English Reformation, though, because it's a bit different for several reasons. It came from a different place, and it ended up in a different place as well. And I, I've been told by Catholics who don't want to listen to what I have to say, uh, that they don't want to follow a religion that was started by a king who wanted a second wife. So is that what the English Reformation is all about? Is that what we're offering people when we start to talk to them about Jesus? So the English Reformation is also interesting because the Puritans who eventually came to North America, they left England. So by 1527, Henry VIII wanted to annul his marriage because after 20 years, they had no living son, just one daughter who is Mary Tudor. Now, last week we saw the state of the papacy at this time. Do you think any of those popes would have had a problem granting Henry an annulment? Particularly since the request would have been accompanied by lots of English gold and whatever else Henry had lying around that he thought would look good in St. Peter's. But his timing was really, really bad. The same turmoil that kept Luther alive, remember Charles, the Emperor, Francis of France, the Pope, they're all fighting. So that same turmoil that kept Luther alive resulted in a big problem for Henry because the Pope had recently been captured by and was still under the eye of Charles V, the Emperor, who happened to be the nephew of the lady that Henry wanted to shove into a nunnery. Catherine of Aragon, his first wife was the daughter of their most Catholic majesties, Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. She was staunchly Catholic. She had been brought up in a far more royal house than Henry. Henry was only the second tutor, and they came from the wrong side of the blanket anyway. There was no way that she was going to give up her royal position voluntarily. She believed that her marriage was valid. If Pope Clement had ruled otherwise, she might have accepted it, but that was just what Clement couldn't do. So he strung it out for years. In this situation, Henry is open to any solution. He was not interested at all in Reformation doctrinal changes. As a matter of fact, he'd written a refutation of Luther's points in 1521, and the Pope was so pleased with it that he gave him the title Defender of the Faith. But he was interested in the notions of political freedom from Rome. They went along with it. So, uh, by a very long process involving parliament and laws, these laws had come from Wycliffe's time when there was real uneasiness in England with the obedience demanded by Rome that had never gone away. The crime of putting the papacy above the church was invoked often. So eventually, Henry is declared supreme head of the church in England. So uh, Henry got rid of the Pope, but he kept the title. And the monarch in England to this day still has among the titles defender of the faith. So as soon as he was supreme head, he uh, annulled his marriage to Catherine. He shoved her off in a castle away up in the north of England where she eventually died in misery and penury, actually. He regularized his marriage to Anne Boleyn, which he had already, had already taken place. He dissolved the monasteries. He stopped all money that would normally have gone to Rome, and there was a lot of it. He stopped all of that money going to Rome, and he himself kept it instead. But for Henry, the only doctrinal change in the Anglican Church was that the Pope was no longer head of the Church. He was. But there were always reformers around, and sometimes Henry had found them useful in his fight, which had gone on for at least seven, eight years. So sometimes he had found them useful, and sometimes he had been against them. But because they were there, reformed ideas like the Bible in English and services in English took hold over the, all of this time. Now, four of Henry's six queens were actually on the side of reform. Uh, William Tyndale and Miles Coverdale both translated the Bible into English at this time. Now, Henry's son, Edward, was much more reformed, and who knows what really might have happened to the Anglican Church, but he only ruled for six years. Then Henry's daughter, Mary, who is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. She was determined to return the land to obedience to Rome. And uh, in pursuit of that, many were burnt at the stake. This led to her title of Bloody Mary and the absolute determination of the English people to never again have a Catholic monarch. After five years, Mary died, and Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry and Anne Boleyn, came to the throne. Now, Elizabeth was a Protestant, obviously. 
Her father had to have been right, otherwise she was illegitimate. But her own experiences of living under the threat of death under Mary and the years of bloodshed that she had seen had turned her off any sort of extremism. She wanted a uniform church where everyone could fit. So she kept a delicate balance of moderately Calvinistic theology, plus as much ancient practice and governance as did not contradict it, but it took the force of Elizabeth's personality to make it work. So Henry had wanted a unified church, Elizabeth wanted a unified church, but change is coming. Since Constantine had been accepted, the church and state should be one, all the people in one state hold the same religion, that's partly why Elizabeth wanted to get everybody in onto the one tent. Luther, Swingley, Calvin, they all believed it. All of them would engage in civil life. The Anabaptists didn't, we've already looked at them, but they were condemned as heretics on all sides and also by the civil government. But in the 17th and 18th centuries, this notion is breaking down because the new ideas are spreading through the lands with no respect for borders. The printing press really helped this, where it was very easy to publish and spread your ideas all over, well, what at that point was the known world. So this is, this is breaking down, this notion is breaking down. Um, wars were fought to try to keep this notion going, but those wars failed. And uh, Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, everybody did it. It wasn't only one side. There were wars in France. There were wars in Germany. There were wars in England. A lot of people died. It led to the Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648, which, being one of the most savage wars before World War I, seriously made people doubt if religious belief should be forced on people at the point of the sword. You may have wanted religious conformity in your state, but the cost was just too high. And eventually this led to the idea of a state without religious connections, which is the kind of state that we live in now where there's lots of shades of belief and nobody thinks that everybody in the country should have exactly the same belief. Now there's contributing factors to this change as well. We're beginning to see sovereigns who change or use their religion for political gain, again on both sides. Henry IV of France is famous for saying Paris is worth a mass. He had been a Huguenot Protestant, but when he inherited the French crown, he changed to be Catholic because Paris, and most of France actually, was an extremely Catholic country. The German princes, the Protestant German princes, were no better. They were very inclined to use their religion as well for political gain, which didn't sit well with German nationalists. Germans were beginning to feel that they, they are a, per, a people. German. So we also see a hardening of belief in the orthodoxies, really as rock-like as the medieval Roman church again on all sides. Uh, Luther, Swingley, and Calvin, you know, the first reformers, they have been joyous in their newfound freedom from the oppressive structure. And had it just been, you know, the early reformers, they may all have been able to agree. But their followers were not like that. They were very zealous. They didn't use religion insincerely, but they were defensive. They were safeguarding belief rather than living it out in love for others. You had to believe everything in those creeds or you would be cast out of the fold. Also, the wars of religion, Germany, France, England, and uh, that really soured many to the idea of any sort of religion. And this is when we begin to hear about atheists, really, for the first time. Then the new scientific discoveries provoked a re-examination of traditional beliefs. Now, the works of Aristotle were introduced in the 13th century. Aristotle believed in acquiring knowledge by our senses. It's not speculation, but you look and touch and taste. And this contributed to the development of empirical science, which does exactly that. So we have Galileo, we have Kepler, we have Newton, and every new scientific discovery that made sense of the world added to the confidence in human powers of reason. Also, the Industrial Revolution brought huge changes in wealth. I mean, whole new pe classes of people were now wealthy. The power of the landed aristocracy is breaking down. Merchants uh, now can become wealthy or, or wealthier. So reactions to all this change, uh, some people left. The Puritans sailed for the New World. After Elizabeth, the Stuart dynasty ruled. They were half French. They believed in the divine right of kings to rule and would have liked an absolute regime as in France. And so as a result, they supported the Anglican structure of bishops and were much harder on nonconformists. 
So there was persecution, and some Puritans left to practice their faith in peace. Then some uh, embraced spirituality, like the Quakers, that's only one, but as an example, um, they turned away from the dogma, from the uh, tight confines. Uh, George Fox was the leader of the Quakers. Uh, he knew scripture well. And in 1644, he began to make his views known. You know, churches are just houses made with hands. Hymns and all the paraphernalia of worship are all human hindrances. Everyone has an inner light to guide them. This isn't natural reason, and it's not a set of moral principles. It's a capacity to recognize and accept the presence of God. He believed in being taught by the Spirit. So in their services, they were quiet until somebody felt moved by the Spirit to speak. Some tried a return to intense piety and personal faith, like the Pietists and the Methodists. Uh, Pietists, again, it's return to Scripture, Forget fighting about all these small doctrinal issues. Correct doctrine is important, but it's the start and not the end of a Christian's piety. And they got together in small groups to learn, uh, read the Bible, learn about Scripture. The Methodist, John Wesley too, organized small groups to read the Bible, to pray, to discuss religious matters, and to collect funds because the Methodists really were meeting people's financial and physical needs as well. The Industrial Revolution, while making some people extremely rich, had also made some people extremely poor. People flooded into the cities for work, so they lost their local connections, they lost their local church connections, they lost uh, financial support connections instead of living in a big extended family, where at least, you know, your farm would have probably fed you. Now you're in cities with really nothing. So the Methodists were concerned to meet those real financial needs as well definitely added to their popularity. Then some turned to reason, and rationalism swept Europe. Now, I've mentioned the increasing confidence in, in the power of reason. From the Renaissance on, the introduction of Aristotle, people began to have great interest in the natural world. And also there's disillusionment with religious conflict and the dogmatism, the narrow orthodoxies. Um, really just shows that every time you move away from how Jesus acted, it puts people off. So, new thought. And uh, there's some famous names here, and uh, the discussion could get really deep, but in the interest of time, I'll just state briefly the main idea of each. And bear in mind that most of these men were believers. They intended to bolster Christianity by their ideas and methods. So we get Rene Descartes, and he wanted to establish things that he knew with certainty. He was really impressed by mathematics and geometry, and he basically wanted to put life on the same kind of footing. So he started from doubt of everything, except he was sure that he was thinking. So he started there, I think, therefore I am. And the second principle was that in his mind there was an idea of God a higher being than himself. And since it's impossible for one's mind to conceive of something higher than it, this thought must have been placed there by God. So therefore, his second principle was that he had proved the existence of God. So from there, he felt that he could go on and prove the existence of his body and everything else in nature. But how to reconcile the, the thinking mind or the soul with his body was a problem. He never really came up with a good answer it led to lots of questions about how spirit and matter relate. There were a few solutions proposed by other people, but none of them was very popular. So then we kept uh, other theories. In England, we have John Locke, empiricism. And he said that knowledge comes through outer experiences. So, so Descartes had been looking into his mind. You know, I'm looking at my mind. What am I thinking about? Where do I go from there? John Locke said knowledge comes through outer experiences, the inner workings by which we know ourselves, and the existence of God, which is proved by the existence of the first two. And I actually don't see how that proves the existence of God unless you already believe in him. I'm not sure you'd have got there from a position of non-belief. But Locke is philosophizing with confidence in the reasoning process. This is the time he lives in. So he also added probability in his theories. Now, we don't apply the strict proofs of reason to probability, but rather judgment. So if you know that John lives at 12 Dufferin Lane, it's probable that he still lives there, even though you don't actually see him at this moment with your very eyes. So faith is an ascent to knowledge from revelation. 
Therefore, it's not certain and needs to be measured by reason and judgment to decide the probability of what we are being asked to believe. So therefore, he believed in tolerance because religion is not based on certainty. So therefore, you can't treat it like you could something that was proved by reason. But he did think that Christianity is the most reasonable of religions, but also that it didn't add anything which people could not have found out by reason. And I'm not sure if he includes the specific revelation about Jesus in this analysis, because, I mean, how would you know anything specific about God without revelation? Uh, then we have the deists. Now, the deists were trying to steer a course between the narrow pronouncements of the very strict orthodoxies that had built up and, all, and not abandoning a belief in religion. And there again, we have a reference to atheists. So they said religion is what is natural to all mankind. It comes from our natural instincts. No particular revelations are required. And uh, Toland's book is typical of the, uh, the output of, of those people. Christianity, not mysterious. A treaty showing that there is nothing in the gospel contrary to reason or above it, and that no Christian doctrine can properly be called a mystery. So it's all reason. They're cutting out the supernatural. They thought that observation and reason could determine the existence of God. And they definitely discounted the particular historical revelation of Jesus and the incarnation. And again, I'm asking, like, how would you know anything about Jesus without specific revelation? I mean, God, of course, has left himself a witness in nature. If, if you live on this planet, you have no excuse for not believing in God. But that's general knowledge about God and not specific. However, the real criticism came from other philosophers. And we get David Hume. He criticized all these theories about reason. He showed that they, were, that they were assuming much that they couldn't prove by their own, their very own definitions of reason, including about substances and cause and effect. So Hume pointed out that that last step between observing something like a ball hitting another ball, the ball hits the other ball, the other ball moves. You can observe that over and over and over, but the last step of saying, aha, the ball hitting the other ball is what is causing it to move. He said, that's not, you've taken that step in your mind. That is not observed. Same with substances. You know, you look at this thing in your hand and it's red and has a certain smell and it has a certain flavor. And so you put all those attributes together and you say, this is an apple. But again, you've taken that step in your mind. By observation, you cannot say that all those attributes are an apple. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that you have not proved it by reason. So therefore, he cast doubt on the deist argument for the existence of God. Because if you can't prove cause and effect, then you can't say that because the world exists, therefore God must have created it, which was the deist's reasonable argument for the existence of God. And you also end up with no certain knowledge at all, which is okay in a philosophy class, but not so good in real life. Which is why, in reaction to Hume, we get the Scotsman James Reid, and he argued for self-evident knowledge or common sense. I mean, I have a body, it is here. Maybe I can't prove that by reason, but it's self-evident, it is here. So he was like, common sense people, we have to live, right? So that was what was known as common sense philosophy. Now, in France, Voltaire took this and Locke's stance on political and uh, religious tolerance to argue for civil rights. He said that monarchy is for the subjects, not for the rulers. He didn't really think of not having monarchy. You know, monarchy was uh, essential, but it should be for the benefit of the subject whose rights all must respect. And his, his mate, uh, Monescu, applied that to government uh, since power corrupts. We need three levels to prevent corruption, legislative, executive, and judicial. And if that prescription for government sounds familiar, it's because it is. The American revolutionaries were very influenced by French philosophical views. And it lends an interesting flavor to the development of the US as well. But then Immanuel Kant came along, and he broke the whole structure down by showing that our minds order the sensations that we receive into categories by which we understand them. And those categories were space, time, and 12 other categories, including existence. So 
If existence is just a category in our mind, then we can't use it to prove the existence of God. So reason can't know things like the existence of God or the soul or eternity. It doesn't mean that God's not real. It just means that you can't know whether or not he is real by reason. So the easy, confident rationalism of Descartes and Locke and the deists, it's all gone. Now later, the universality of Kant's categories was questioned by later philosophers. These categories are affected by psychology, by culture, by language. Anything that's universal is, is always broken down into further things. So it seemed that everyone agreed with Kant. Okay, so where do the theologians go for here? We agree that we can't prove the existence of God by pure reason. So find somewhere else for it. The place of religion is not in pure reason. One response is it's in practical reason or the moral sense, and this is actually where Kant landed. Because we have a conscience, there must be a God. Or you can say that humans are more than cold reason. This is kind of the influence of romanticism. Religion is not knowledge or moral reason, but it's a specific feeling of dependence of God. Now, this is uh, Schleiermacher. He was very careful to say he's not just talking about feeling, some kind of fleeting emotion, but a very specific feeling of dependence on God. But you can see the danger in that idea. Feeling is very subjective very easy to be distorted by other people. Uh, you could also affirm that reason is reality, and this was Hegel's response. Now, reason isn't defined as just whatever happens to be in your head. It's forming an idea, questioning it, and then coming to a conclusion. So you have a thesis on one hand, you have an antithesis on the other, and you kind of come to a synth synthesis. So it's a very dynamic, it's a moving thing. So he also believed that this reason, this dynamic movement, doesn't only take place in the human mind. The universal reason is the spirit. Now, whether he's talking about the spirit of God, like the Holy Spirit, I'm not really clear on. But the spirit is the whole of reality. So all of history is the thought of the spirit. And he built a huge system on this idea, and he did include all of history in it. He thought that Christianity was the absolute religion because in it, the human and the divine meet in Jesus, because all religions are concerned about the relationship between the human and the divine, and in Christianity, they meet. So therefore, it is the ultimate religion. Now, this was pretty easily attacked because the system was just so big, there were many areas of attack. But his theory about the progressive unfolding of the spirit made an impact on Charles Darwin and his research. Another response could be to say, well, yes, Reason can't show ultimate truth, but faith can. So revelation is necessary. And being a Christian involves the whole person, not just your mind. And a leap of faith is necessary. This is uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, he said, you know, the people who saw Jesus with their physical eyes didn't necessarily become believers. They didn't just look at him and, oh, I don't have any choice, now I'm a Christian. They had to make a leap of faith and there's a cost to be paid for that. He thought that the worst thing for Christians was living in Christendom, where it was far too easy to be a Christian and quite difficult not to be. Faith isn't meant to be easy. There's supposed to be a cost. Now, he didn't make a lot of stir in the 19th century when he was writing his stuff, but he did become much more important in the 20th century. And another place that you can ground religion is in the practical life must remember that God revealed himself in real time in Jesus. We're not talking about mysticism. We're talking about a factual thing. And the center of Jesus' teachings was the kingdom of God and his ethics, which is action based on love. This is Albrecht Ritchell. So the, uh, I mean, the Industrial Revolution, as mentioned before, had lifted millions out of poverty, but it also broke all those links and left people without support. And there was real suffering. So this... Um, idea of locating religion in the practical life influenced Walter Rauschenbusch's social gospel, which was calling for change in government to address the real conditions of real people living in New York in the early 20th centuries. But despite that, in general, throughout the 1800s, people felt that humans were only getting better. There was progress. Um, you know, we're understanding the world, the scientific discoveries that we're making are making sense of everything. The Industrial Revolution has made a lot of people wealthier. So in general, People are getting better. 
But World War I destroyed that easy confidence in human progress that really all had held, philosophers, theologians, politicians. So after it, theologians began to look again at the sixth century reformers to see if there was anything there that had been missed in the teaching in the century since. Karl Barth, a German who wrote Church Dogmatics, is one of the towering figures. You'd also think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany. He was executed just before the Nazis uh, were defeated at the end of the war. Now, Catholic, Roman Catholic theology had not tried to accommodate itself to rational thinking through these years. It had just condemned modern ideas, and it had tried to keep the theological interests of its people under control. So it didn't suffer the same disappointment when World War I broke out and it became obvious that humanity was not on this, you know, escalator up that the Protestant theologians felt. And in the US, actually, confidence wasn't dented really by World War I because World War I had made the US very, very prosperous. And it wasn't until the Depression in the 1930s. But the history of the faith in the US is really another entire session. Also, you'll notice that in any of this, I haven't mentioned martyrs or missionaries. Again, all of these are potential subjects for further sessions. But let's take a quick look at denominations. Uh, from the tree above, it would seem that the Eastern Orthodox are indeed justified in their criticism of people so determined to divine to the nth degree that they can't hold a common set of beliefs. And that too is an interesting discussion. You might be able to see it too well, but the Baptists come off the Anglican here in uh, 1612. Uh, these were people who felt that the Anglican changes had not gone far enough. John Smith was an Anglican priest, and he formed an independent congregation. Now, he and his followers were forced to flee to Amsterdam, where actually they came in contact with some Anabaptists and got divided between those who would take oaths and those who wouldn't. So the oath-takers returned to England and set up the first churches there in 1612. And by the 1640s, many of them had moved to the New World, where they spread throughout the uh, 13 colonies. So I'd mentioned that some of the founders of America were deists who had cut out the supernatural from their belief in God. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously actually cut out all the supernatural passages from his Bible. And uh, he did not believe that Jesus was divine. So it seems he was left with Jesus really just as a great moral teacher I think C.S. Lewis is, uh, he ably really disintegrates. That was the foundation for faith. I mean, if you listen to what Jesus says and you don't believe that he is divine or the son of God, he, he's obviously a liar since he spends most of his time saying that he is the son of God or else he's mad. He thinks he's the son of God, he's just delusional or else he's telling the truth. So there really isn't any room left for Jesus as just a great moral teacher. But I think many people today do you see Jesus as only a great moral teacher, despite how contradictory it is? But interestingly, it's in the U.S. that these modern spiritual movements originated. I mean, they're all over the world now, but that's through missionary activity. But if we look at Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, we see that each of them leans on a supernatural revelation. Now, the uh, Mormons started in 1830, the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So, uh, not that long afterwards, you have Joseph Smith, who is having visions, he's having a revelation. He published the Book of Mormon in 1830. And a bit like Muhammad, Joseph Smith saw his revelations as the culmination of the revelation of God. They have the Old Testament, they have the New Testament, and now you have the final revelation, which is the Book of Mormon. Everybody is a spirit child of God, and Jesus is just the eldest spirit child of God. He came to earth to conquer death and sin so that the other spirit children of God could come back to him. Everyone's resurrected, and there's a judgment after death on your faith and your works. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing here. There's a lot more to, to each of these. Jehovah's Witnesses, they started in the 1870s. They think that the Bible and other writings are inspired, so we do have spiritual revelation uh, Jesus is the first created being. He's not the Son of God. He's not divine, so we know what that is. That's Arianism. 
Only the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation go to heaven, and others are resurrected eventually for life on the redeemed earth. But each of them is relying on Revelation. Also, we have Christian science and Scientology, and again, 1875, Mary Baker Eddy was divinely inspired to write her book, which again is the last revelation. Spirit and matter are very divided. The spirit is, only the spirit is real. Matter is imaginary. So they divide them to the point where physical illness isn't considered to be real. Scientology, again, humans, humans are spirits caught in a physical being. You go through increasingly spiritual awareness until you understand affinity and your relationship to the supreme being. And that's very like Gnosticism. You know, sparks of the spirit from long ago are caught in a physical body. So obviously these are, uh, there's a lot more to these, but it's the emphasis on spirituality and su the supernatural that I find interesting because I wonder if all these reactions, which all started in the States, are a reaction to the deliberate cull of the supernatural by the founding fathers of the US. It's kind of the, the silent country. If we think of C.S. Lewis as the silent planet, which was closed off to all supernatural communication. But that all forms part of a much bigger study of the development of belief in the US, which can't help but affect us here in Canada. And incidentally, I don't really know much about how different denominations spread here in Canada or the development of our culture. And this session has probably raised more questions than provided answers, which is inevitable as we get closer to our own time. But what lessons can we draw from what we have seen? So basically, never ally with a secular power. People flood into your church for the wrong reason and it dilutes the faith. Never be in a position to receive privileges from a secular power. It leads to corruption and damages the faith. Never coerce by violence people to join your church. They don't believe, and it damages the reputation of the faith forever after. Never allow the joy of faith and the liberation of what Jesus has done for us to harden into a structure that keeps people out. It only damages the faith. Never allow your capacity to use your mind, which is a gift of God, to cause you to throw out revelation or the supernatural. Submit yourself and your ideas over and over to Scripture. O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and then thus gone astray from the truth. Paul to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21. Thank you.